Good afternoon. Uh, it's one minute past four, so we, we can start our webinar on the protection of intellectual property in China for the furniture industry. Uh, first, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Leonardo Mosca. I will be mod moderating the, the webinar session today. Uh, I'm the project executive for the, the China IPR SME help desk. And for, uh, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with the project, uh, SME stands for, of course, uh, Small and Medium Enterprises and uh, IPR, it's uh, Intellectual Property Rights. Uh, we will have a small, a small introduction of the, of the services in a couple of slides, but uh, in any case, feel free to send me uh, an email uh, regarding IP issues or a webinar, a uh, question regarding the webinar or the, our services to the, the email address that you see on the screen. Uh, before we actually start the, the session, just a couple of words uh, on the, the webinar interaction tool, which is the, the panel you see on the right side of the screen. Uh, and that is, is it can uh, help you control the audio and video setting. And more importantly, to uh, will allow you to as well engage with the speakers by uh, sending a question via the question log that you see uh, in the in the, the fourth uh, line with the with an arrow. You just uh, need to to if you if you want to raise any questions uh, for our speakers or regarding the technical issues you're experiencing you're experiencing with the webinar, feel free to type your question. Uh, they will be collected, of course, throughout the webinar and addressed uh, by our speakers at the end of the session during the, the question and answers. Also, um, a quick reminder, don't worry if you miss some details during the presentation as the, the PowerPoint slides as well as the, the video recording will be available from tomorrow on our website. So uh, you will be able to review more in detail uh, parts of the webinar or extract some of the information in the, in the slides whenever you want. Uh, so now uh, a brief introduction on the, on the help desk. The, the China IPR SME help desk is an initiative by the European Commission providing free assistance to European enterprises interested or already working with, uh, with China. Uh, and when we say China, we actually mean uh, greater China. So it includes as well uh, assistance uh, to companies working in Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong and Macau. The, the most direct support we provide is uh, our inquiry helpline, which is an email address where you can send any question you have regarding uh, the protection of intellectual property for your product. And our experts will uh, reply free or free of charge, confidentially, and within uh, working days. Also, we organize training workshops or webinars like today, where our experts, uh, legal specialists, give presentations regarding the protection of intellectual property, either on sector-specific uh, issues, like today on the, on the furniture, but it can also be uh, addressing the, the issue of IP more horizontally. For example, next week, we have a webinar with the other two help desks uh, on the protection of IP abroad. So that will be more general. Uh, we also provide, of course, uh, material to download, guides, fact sheets, e-learning modules that you will that you will be able to find on our website. Uh, the China IPR SME help desk is one of the IPR SME help desk uh, set up by the Commission. There are also uh, similar projects addressing different markets. So in addition to China, there is as well the Southeast Asia uh, uh, IPR SME help desk, the Latin America IPR SME help desk, and the European IPR SME help desk. Uh, so uh, now it's, uh, it's time to welcome our, our speakers. We have uh, Dana Dragonici from the Transylvanian Furniture Cluster, which is uh, co-hosting the, the webinar session today. Good morning, Dana. Uh, good afternoon, sorry. Uh, I don't know if you can hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Good morning and thank you for joining good us morning. today. Thank you also uh, for the opportunity. As well, great. Um, as well, we have our uh, IP legal specialist, Alessandra Kies, working for the China IPR SIM help desk. Good afternoon, Alessandra. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Great. So uh, now, before we uh, we start, we give uh, the floor to our speakers. Uh, just a brief presentation on the agenda. Uh, after my my introduction, we will have an overview of the of the Transylvanian furniture cluster and their services, and then uh, we will focus on on the IPR protection with uh, the session by our legal specialist Alessandra Kies. At the end, of course, we will address any questions uh, we have collected uh, via the, the question log, the, the webinar interaction tool, uh, or any further issue we, that might arise during the webinar. So without uh, further ado, I can leave the floor to you, Dana, for the, for the presentation of your cluster. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone that is uh, with us today. I would like to make a short presentation about our cluster, uh, who we are. Uh, the Transylvanian Furniture Cluster gathers together over 84 members from the furniture industry, uh, research development, design and consultancy companies from the northwest region of Romania, which are our main services, Gate for Export, Together for Transylvanian Furniture, Common Pro procurements, learn to do, and advocacy. Uh, in order to offer our clients a great business experience, besides complete furnishing solutions, we have created a high quality qualified export team and a smart procedure for manufacturing and quality control. This way, we help our clients to save time, energy, and money. Event planning services and joint participation in international events is uh, another thing that we are doing. Uh, also, in order to obtain preferential prices when buying inputs, cluster management negotiates with the main suppliers, having the advantage of a significant purchasing power as a group. We are also uh, implied in recruitment and specialized training aiming to support our member firms with the recruitment and training process. We are monitoring uh, of the legislative initiative and formulating public positions to support the, the interest of our members. And uh, the reason that we are uh, we are interested in IPR China, we want to make a collaboration with uh, designers from Asia to develop specific products or furniture for China market. This way, we need to know how to protect our products in China from an innovation point of view, design, and not only. And now I will let my uh, my colleague uh, to speak about this topic. Thank you, thank you, Dana, for your presentation. Uh, we can now dive into the 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 IP protection in China for the for the industry. Uh, but quickly before that. Uh, a short introduction about our, our legal specialist today. Alessandra Chies uh, is an Italian lawyer who lived in China for nine years and has an extensive experience in assisting European international companies uh, in IP protection. Uh, she is also collaborating with uh, several uh, European projects and is a member as well of the INTA uh, Anti-Counterfeiting Committee uh, and a qualified trademark design attorney. So, Alessandra, uh, it's time now maybe to engage a little bit with our experts, with our audience. Uh, we have prepared um, a survey. Uh, you will see now a, a pop-up window where you can actually select select the, the answer. So, the question would be, how uh, have you re already registered your IPR in China? So, I will launch the poll right now. Okay, so you will see that the, the answer uh, are yes, I, I have registered my IPR in China. Yes, but uh, registration is pending. Uh, no, but I plan to register or uh, no at all. Uh, maybe, Alessandra, while we wait for a further input by our at, uh, attendees, you might spend some words regarding your experience in, in the sector if, if you think that in general, companies in the furniture industry are well aware of, of uh, the risks of, of IP in China. Uh, yes, um, now luckily the situation of awareness of the importance of registering rights in China or protecting innovation in China is, is um, 
becoming much, much better compared with, for example, 10 years ago. So we started to know in Europe, we started to understand that the potential of the market and the importance no, of registering the right. But there is still the little bit of uncertainty, let's say, and um, not that positive attitude sometimes. And many companies, especially SMEs, say, no, I'm not registering because it's not worthy. Everyone is copying me anyhow. So I'm very curious to know where we stand here now to see also, you know, how to structure further our our discussion. I very much hope that uh, um, at least there is some plan. I mean, I want to see very few no. <laughs> Just the, the the no one shouldn't be an option anymore. Okay, let's see then. Uh, I can hope close so. the poll. Uh, <laughs> share the results so you see no, that 50%. unfortunately no. yes the majority uh hasn't registered the ipr in china and are not planning to register but maybe we hope that they will change their mind after the after our live session uh 25 percent yes uh registered let's say 50 percent yes 50 percent no 50 percent uh among the 50 percent of the yes some is uh still waiting for the registration to go through uh and the 50 percent of no uh from what we know now are not planning to register so i can leave you to to comment the results and uh to go on of course with your uh, presentation and uh, i will also give you the uh the control of the slides yeah well i very much hope that the 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 blunt no and i'm not interested in it it was just let's say a, a mistake in in the a typo mistake uh, but uh, I, I'll get this. Uh, okay, let me just. Uh, okay, can you see it fine? Yeah. Yes. Um, all right. So moving on then, let, let let's start to see why that no, and I'm not interested should change in a list I'm planning to. Because it's totally understandable that it's great that 50% have already uh, done it or the, the procedure are in process. And But let, let's see why, let's clear some of the fears that can happen to say no, which I very much understand because it's uh, it's something that I've been come across quite often, as I said before. So we will look at, in general, what are this bunch of intellectual property rights, the trademarks, the invention patterns, design, how they can help the furniture industry, what are the common mistakes that we have to avoid to make the, the investment worthwhile, and then some, some hints also on the enforcement uh, procedure. This is going to be our agenda for today, because clearly, if we're all sitting here, we, we know the potential of the of the market in, in in general terms like mainland china is the eu second largest trading partner after the usa many believe that is soon to become the first one and the eu is china largest trading partner so it's undeniable there that there is a market for everything and for everyone uh, and for the furniture industry in in, uh, in specific, uh, because China is changing from the word furniture factory to the word furniture market. So it's a market is becoming not a production market, but just a, a consumer market because of the of the growth of the um, middle class purchasing power i've seen it with my eyes i've seen the changes the the interest also in the in the fashion in the furniture in the design in general coming from from the eu they're very much attracted to that so in addition to that there is an urbanization rate growing terribly and also a lot of renovation of the uh, household for the young generation they want to you know to 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 be more close to to the western um, fashion let's say so there is a great demand of furniture every time we have a demand for something there is also unfortunately the other side of the medal which is the uh, risk in having the counterfeiting uh, products on the market here i put a screenshot of um of a search a quick search i've done on uh, one of the most common platform i just typed 
furniture and as we can see a lot of let's say inspirational products um, from known design came up so it, it's like two sides of the medal uh, just to to, uh, to say that I put also here um, a link to one of the uh, guides of the um, SME help desk China SME help desk um, which is specific for the uh, protection of the uh, in China for the furniture industry so there is a lot of uh, tips there and you can also look at that more for more details for more data for more statistics but the idea here is to say okay I have I have created something with a design for example I have a brand identity with my trademark I even have created like a new um, mechanism for something I have an invention patent I have a wonderful picture on my catalog I have a copyright I have a website that someone can access I have a domain name I mean sometimes we don't even realize what is the um, the broad spectrum of intellectual property rights and and what are the core aspect which is registration registration uh, it's fundamental because the it's a money that you have to invest in it's, it's true and sometimes it's like uh, it's seen like just uh, like open the wallet but it's not to be seen in that way because the money spent on IPR protection is an investment an investment that creates an asset uh, intellectual property rights can be evaluated even by by bank in terms of uh, value of your company in the same way of a machine to produce um, furniture or they, they value a, a, as the salary of a designer I mean it's an asset of the company and should be protected as such the idea of um, having uh, the, the attitude I'm not doing it in China I'm not spending money in protection in China because it's not worthy everyone is gonna copy me anyhow it's really something that should not apply anymore because the legislation and enforcement procedures are greatly improving over the years and now if you have a right you have a weapon to um, use in case someone is copying you the important thing is that you have to necessarily rely on some attorneys and experts in the jurisdiction because there are a lot of differences with the with the legislation and the um, the, the the approach to to enforcement, for example. But knowing how to move into that territory makes a huge uh, difference. So a good lawyer is always a um, positive attitude. And I will stress it many, many, many times. You will hate me for that at the end on the registration part, because <clears throat> unfortunately it's uh, very much forgotten that it's not just the fact that I don't want to register because anyone, anyhow, maybe someone is copying me and I can't do anything because China is not letting me do anything, which we say it's not right. We have to see also the other side of the metal, uh, medal again, which is um, the if, if someone copies your trademark, for example, then you will become the infringer, then you cannot produce, you cannot sell in China anymore because someone else become the owner of that design, someone else becomes the owner of that trademark. The exclusive rights belongs to the person that registered it in that country for first, not use it first, registered first so no matter if in Europe you have your trademark for 10 years it's not yours in China it will become yours only after you have it uh, registered um, about trademarks you have uh, two routes and you can choose the uh, national route or the international route uh, national route is basically when you go to the uh, trademark office of uh, China trademark office and you file a trademark which is valid in China and China only so no trademark uh, sorry no Hong Kong no Taiwan uh, no Macau because they have a separate office and you have to go for a separate registration so here just mainland China uh, the international route is when you 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 file let's say an application through the 
uh, World Intellectual Property Office in many different countries, the one of your interest. So if now you have, for example, your trademark in uh, in Romania and you're thinking you're just interested in China because you have to close a business deal, then it's worth to go for the single filing for the national route. Instead, if you're planning a more strategic um, approach to registration, for example, you want to register in US, in China, in Japan, in the EU, then it's maybe worth to go for the international route. This is something that you reason with your attorney, also based on budget consideration, because the international route become um, a better choice if you have a lot of uh, countries, because it has let's say a basic fee so whether it's one country or whether it's 10 the basic fee is the same and then you pay for um, each country separate separate let's say bunch of money but the the the, the most um, expensive part is the basic fee the national route it's much more viable also when you have the need to get um, a quick a quicker let's say a registration because it's a little bit more quick and you immediately have a, a registration certificate in a Chinese so there is some advantages in in both ways none is wrong none is the best depending on your situation um, and going to the um, certificate I just mentioned is something that I noted it causes a little bit of issues because when you have an international trademark, for the international trademark, you will not have uh, immediately, when the trademark is registered, you will not have a registration certificate in Chinese. And for some enforcement action or for opening up, let's say, a pop-up store or to close up a deal with a large um, Chinese uh, buyer, if that person is serious, he wants to see your registration before investing, in, you know, in maybe some marketing activities with your trademark. So if you have to produce the registration certificate of an international trademark, you will need to ask it to the China Trademark Office and it takes three, four months to be issued. So it's some timings, strategies are also important to consult with the, with your own lawyer to get it right and close a business deal um, quickly. And another important part is the translation and transliteration of the trademark. There is a lot of issues there because in China, everyone, I mean, is a country that speaks a different language, the rights in a different way, with a different culture, and they will tend to um, they will tend to assign a Chinese translation of your trademark, especially if you gain popularity. And every one of us hopes that we will gain the popularity uh, so as to be recognized strongly in the market. When that happens, but you will never know when it happens, so it's better to play uh, ahead, you will be assigned a name. So I, I made an example here. The consumer may decide one. It may be very unfortunate, like it happened, for example, to um, Ralph Lauren. This is a typical case to, to mention. I mean, at one point, they decided to, to call it um, San Jaoma, which means that three-legged horse, so basically like a crippled horse, which is not really like fitting for, for a company like that. So you, you, can, you have to give the same importance of the Chinese transliteration of your own brand as if it would be your brand, because it's how it will be called in China. Um, if your name has, let's say, a proper translation, for example, uh, Apple, Apple, it's the apple. So in Chinese, it's been given the name of apple in Chinese. So it's pinguo. Um, you can go for the translation. Most often for the foreign uh, companies, we pick a transliteration, which is basically the uh, reproducing the sound in Chinese of the uh, your Western, let's say, brand. So, for example, Agendas is called Agendas, which means laugh, root, reach, this. It has no meaning, but each character has a positive meaning for Chinese culture. This is very important. Or if you are Pepsi, Subway or Coca-Cola, you can try to hire some very good marketing people, which will try to combine like 
like super the one of coca-cola which is says in chinese ke ko ke la, and means makes the mouth happy or subway side by way better than 100 flavors so just remember here just some brainstorming i'm getting in the market do i need to consider the translate the translation or transliteration and the answer is always yes because a lot of company make this mistake even large company like for example new balance here we saw that um, they started they they started to use a transliteration which was a sim by loon but they never register it and a chinese individual registered that uh, trademark sim by loon and develop a local business it was also a shoes business uh, even if new balance tried to cancel to oppose this registration they lost they lost because the trademark belongs to the one that registered first and yet they kept using it to promote the products and Mr. Um, Mr. Joe uh, sued New Balance and I decided to, to keep away, to take away the, the amount of money New Balance was condemned to pay, which was very high and always catch the attention because it was actually 16 million US dollar in first instance, uh, reduced to 800 in second instance. Um, it's not an, a number that should scare us because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's calculated based on the uh, turnover of New Balance. It, it's still anyway a red flag to to say that uh, you lose you will lose the lawsuit if someone else has registered your Chinese um, translation transliteration and they're using it. But this does not mean that this happened because it was a foreign brand. Because in other cases, for example, this one, New Balance won million of dollar in other trademark cases, for example, against this uh, uh, copycat uh, New Boom. Um, other important uh, hints here is to uh, use the trademark and because it can be cancelled by a third party if it's not used for three years from registration. But if you have planned to get in China, imagine that you have about one year for the trademark to be registered, then three years after the registration. So you have about four years to make the plan to start using it. So again, my advice of registering it as soon as possible stand even considering uh, that. And it has to be used exactly in the way in which it's registered. So if you use, for example, the word mark here, pink dog and the logo mark separate, uh, it's not a good idea to register it together to, to save some money in the application. Because if you never use the first version, you know, the, the dog and the pink dog, then that trademark can be cancelled. And also there is some uh, very um, annoying, honestly, issues of uh, uh, classes, uh, subclasses, division. I'm not going to get into much detail on that. But in the question, uh, you, you're more than free to, to ask for more details. In short, a trademark is valid in the class of, of, of your interest. So, for example, for furniture, you pick the class 20. It's not valid for everything. It will not be valid just when you're registered for chemicals or for everything. But in China, every class is divided into subclasses. So the list of the products of interest should be enclosed very carefully in the registration application because it is permitted for two identical trademarks to coexist if the products fall in different subclasses. Here I put the example of the clothing which is pretty easy, like for example, wedding dress are considered different from clothes. So same trademark, for example, red can be registered by company A for clothes, A by company B for wedding dress. For the furniture industry, for example, mirrors are considered different for um, furniture. So it has to be listed carefully. And this is something that a local attorney or um, in China or your uh, your own attorney in your country with the help of an expert in China can assess very carefully. Just remember to raise this concern when you discuss for your trademark registration in, uh, in China. Hong Kong, Taiwan and Macau are separate. So if you're interested in that country, you should go for a separate uh, application. Remember the confirmation certificate 
and also um, conduct an IP right portfolio once in a while. If you have changed the trademark uh, logo over the years, you're producing different products, you change some details of your company. I mean, your portfolio should always be updated with what your company do because it's a reflection of your business. Um, if you have applied and the trademark was uh, rejected because a, a similar or identical trademark exists, you have some um, actions that are set by the uh, legislation. You can oppose it if it's still in the opposition pro, uh, pro, um, timing, um, invalidation action, a cancellation for no news. So sometimes happen that some companies like say a bad faith applicant go to trade fairs and pick all the um, nice trademarks that they see in the trade fair and they applied in china but then they don't use it because many times they just have the intention let's say to ask for some money to sell it so if they've done this more than three years ago and that one blocks your trademark then you can file a cancellation for no news and then get that trademark cancel and register yours so it's a cheap and straightforward option that should always be considered before going into invalidation or cancellation action which are a little bit more lengthy and more expensive and here again as well Whereas the last time I said, the money you invest in registration, it's very little compared with recovering the trademark. Also, because sometimes the chances to recovering it are not very high. Um, coexistence agreement can be considered as well. The Before, they were not accepted a lot. Now, it's more and more accepted in China. So, it could be the case that your trademark is blocked because there is a similar trademark of a very nice a company which is doing its own business and will have no problem in giving you a um, um, coexistence agreement um, with asking no money and and uh, you you will be then able to to go ahead with your registration regarding uh, patents we have uh, switching through this uh, type of ip rights we have three different type of patents um, the invention patents Novelty, inventiveness, and practical applicability are the characteristic of this patent. The utility model, which are sometimes called the, uh, I call them the baby patents, is because they have a lower level of inventive step and they go for no substantive examination. I'm going to explain what is that. Are quicker to obtain and cheaper, cannot be done for processes, but uh, for, for, let's say, furniture industry, most of the time it's, uh, uh, it's not related to process. Uh, designs, designs, now we're entering one, another trade, another right, which is a core and fundamental for the furniture industry designs which protect the shape the pattern the color or the combination of a products which create an aesthetic feeling here here there is no substantive examination but the design must be new so the examination procedure um, why i stress so much the examination part because every right trademark patents, utility model design, go for a formal examination first. The examiner collects your application, check if you pay the fee, if there is your business registration certificate, if you haven't trusted a local attorney because it must uh, be done through a local attorney, if all the papers are in order, let's say. Then there is a step two, which is the substantive examination. So while for patents, for example, the examiner's invention patents, they, they check if it's a new. So if there is another patent everywhere in the world, uh, identical, then they will not uh, grant the patent. Or if it's not inventive enough to be classified as a patent, for utility model and design, they don't do this. So you find an application and potentially everything can be uh, accepted. So in theory, if you file for a bottle of uh, Coca-Cola as a design in China, can be accepted, can be registered. Of course, then anybody can then invalidate your patent because if a design has been made known to the public everywhere in the world, with the internet or a trade fair, it cannot be protected anymore in China. So timing here is 
crucial, it's fundamental. A trademark, you've used it for 10 years, you apply for it in China, nobody has yet copied it, it's yours, if it's registered, it's done. For designs, no. If you have a, a show it at a trade fair, then and then after three, four, six months, one year, it's it's working fine, and you decided to go into the Chinese market. You file the application. We saw before that it will go through because they don't check if it's new, but then your competitors will cancel it. So it cannot be really protected anymore. And one single design, one single right design can make a huge difference in your in your profits, in your business. I made some example here that we all know, but the last one, for example, that bag, it's for um, an Italian producer. It was a sort of small company in, in a small town in Italy. He, he, he thought this, this design was very successful he registered it immediately. Now he sells only this, almost only has few more, this design of a bag, and he has a shop everywhere in the world and a huge turnover for one single right design. So it can really make a difference. The, the problem here, I'll, I'll go directly to an example and then I'll go back because it's very important for me to stress this difference. Some, in, in Europe, we have uh, the uh, non-registered design, we have uh, some grace period. There is some room, you know, to protect a design uh, even if you don't file immediately for registration. In China, in reality, it doesn't exist and it's a mistake that a lot of company make, even for example, Range Rover. Here there is a case of a Range Rover and a land wing of uh, uh, Jang Lin Motors. So Range Rover showed the, um, they, they, they registered the design for, for a Range Rover in China, of course they did for the Evoque, this is the Evoque model. But then they found that this uh, Jang Lin had uh, um, exhibited the uh, land wind uh, SUV at the Guangzhou Motor Show. So Range Rover immediately went and sued them strong of the fact that they had the register designed but what they forgot was that they had shown the design to the public before it filed in china in another publication or something jangling motor find it because nowadays you do a search on the internet and you find it and they invalidate the evoke design patent in china so because it was shown to the public before the design patent was filed in China. So Evoque is not protected in China as a design. Of course, not also the Land Wind X7 is, is protected as a design, but Evoque cannot stop any more copies because it was not right on the timing. So no protection for unregistered design. Um, the novelty standard that we say this grace period exists, I put it just at the bottom, very, very small, because in reality, it has to be done at an international exhibition sponsored or recognized by the Chinese government. Um, in real life, if, if we have it on the internet, if we have a European uh, fair, it's, it's uh, the novelty, it's lost. And um, another important part about the design, uh, it's the fact that to enforce it, you need the patent evaluation report uh, because we say it is not there is no examination on if it's new. So you can have the registration certificate to the authorities, it's fine. But if you want to attack someone else based on a design registered in China, you have to prove that it's new. So you do this sort of the substantive examination, let's say in a second moment. So I want to stop you from using a design which I think is the same as mine. I have to prove with the patent evaluation report which is uh, new. So it's a step. Um, an additional step which is very important to plan for example in trade fair if you want to stop someone to show a design which is similar to yours in a Chinese trade fair you will have to ask for the patent evaluation report in advance of the trade fair because it takes some time and there is also another case another similar case on the design careful planning of design this can be found on the guide 
that I mentioned to you at the beginning on the publication, the guide to IPR protection in China to the furniture industry of the um, IPR uh, SME help desk. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit uh, quicker now because the, the timing it's it's um, is moving fast and I want to, to spend a few words on the enforcement part. On the part of the invention patent, here you rely strongly and almost uh, exclusively on the assistance of the um, attorney, on the patent attorney. Uh, just remember the, fact, the, the part of the translation. Translation, it's extremely important because the patent application are processed in Chinese so translation should be done by a technical expert in Chinese, so no saving on the uh, translation at all. Copyright. Copyright is, the, let's say, the third pillar for the furniture industry. And it's the, um, is a right that does not uh, formally require registration because, uh, um, because China is part of the Berne Convention. The copyright arise in the moment of the creation of the work. So you create it, it's yours, let's say, automatically. But to be able to enforce it in China, so for example, to, to stop someone from using your copyrighted work, it's very much advanced advisable to record it to, with the Copyright uh, Protection Center of uh, China. Uh, we'll see in a second some more details. Um, the copyright uh, protects the original work of authorship, including literally dramatic, musical and artistic work, but also website, catalogs, pictures, architecture, uh, and even pieces of furniture when they become uh, iconic. So it could be an extra protection, but before that, it's something that is very important for the website and the catalogs and the pictures, because most of the times in um, trade fairs on, on the internet, um, infringers, they use our own catalog, our, our own pictures, and we can um, stop this by using the uh, copyright by proving that it's ours, it's called like a prima facie evidence of ownership. Um, we request this um, copyright recordation uh, certificate to the Copyright Protection Center of China. It's a very quick procedure and it's also fairly cheap. The thing is that um, you need to provide a lot of information on the uh, in the application form, the date and location of the first publication, the date and location of creation, details of the authors, how the rights to economically exploit the work were transferred to the company and more. So what this means is that when we create um, a catalog, when we entrust a photographer to take picture, it's always a very good idea to keep um, a tra track of the dates of the uh, contracts and everything. So all this information, if you have them at hand, it's very easy, of course, to fill up a form. If you don't have them and you have to search for them, it becomes a very annoying procedure. And unfortunately, I've seen it even a super large company, sometimes they have a lot of problems in figure it out, remember it, who took that picture, who created the, that catalog, and also on the catalogs, it's very important to always put the um, the year. Because now that we look very quickly on on all the rights, is is like what I love about the furniture uh, industry is that one single product can combine almost all IPR. This is an example of um. At, um Chase Long um, Italian uh, brand, there is the trademark of the Chase Long, there is the um, design, there is uh, the uh, even the patent because there is a, a particular movement to, to, to close it up uh, and down and the, uh, there is the copyright, for example, of the picture that we, we saw, you know, the one that we can see, the one with the, all the, uh, the way in which the, the, the chair can uh, move up and down. So nobody can use that because it's my copyright. Nobody can copy that design because it's my design. Nobody can use my trademark because it's my trademark, but everything has been registered to get to this point. Uh, trade secrets sometimes are forgotten. Um, it's just something. It's just something that uh, um, a piece of information, let's say, uh, but is uh, 
it has to have economical value. So, for example, it can be a process, it can be a, um, a way of organizing a database, even um, the Google algorithm is a trade secret. Okay, of course, everyone knows about the Coca-Cola um, formula. Um, the, the thing here to remember is that when you have a valuable information that you think it can make, um, it can give a, a competitive edge to your business, it can be a trade secret. It can be protected, but you have to put in place some, um, um, let's say, uh, you have to make, keep it secret. I mean, you have to uh, make sure that you um, train your um, your employees uh, on the fact that it is a trade secret. It should not be disclosed to third parties. It can be uh, closed even in a drawer, for example. Sometimes people have won uh, lawsuits of uh, a great value just because they managed to prove that by keeping it closed in a drawer by putting some security measure to the access of the personnel in a specific room, it was regarded by the company as a trade secret and therefore people should not disclose it to the to the public. And nowadays the last one is domain names, but you know domain names are fundamental. So a domain name portfolio revision, it's, uh, it's something that should be done uh, very often, including also uh, top level domain like uh, .cn, .asia and, and etc. So uh, sorry, I'm, I'm running a little bit uh, long, but it's very interesting if now we pass to, um, now we see what we have, what we can have, what we can register. So does our job stop here or we have to actively monitor what's happening? How other people use our brand, our right? Is it something that you do? Do you actively monitor the use of your trademark copyright design uh, in China? Um, yes, no, and I would like to, but I don't know how. And now we're la launching the, um, the, the survey as we did before. So you're gonna see popping up on, on the, the, the screen, the same procedure as of the first poll question. And you can choose your own, um, what you actually do. I would be much less surprised here for the, for the no, but probably I will be overruled like uh, happened the first uh, time because the job of our right owner does not stop with the registration. So I'll give a few more seconds. I just realized that unlucky for every one of us, I didn't, I didn't have a watch close by. Now I do. Uh, it's closed now, and uh, let's uh, let's see. Um, I I cannot see it, but um, let me check. Alessandra, uh, you cannot see the. I cannot the, see the results. The results. Yeah. So basically, it's fifty percent <laughs> no, and fifty percent. Uh -huh. I would like to, but don't know how. Oh, that, 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 that's that's I think a sort of improvement. <laughs> let's <Yes. laughs> let's see no, because it's uh, it's totally understandable here because uh, it sort of requires some. Uh, um, I understand that it requires some um, some money. Let, let's put it very simple. I mean, it's um, you, but sometimes and all, most of the time is much cheaper than what we think it would be. For example, to monitor the trademark gazette. Almost all um, trademark attorneys or law firms with handle, which handle trademarks attorney uh, can um, offer a service of monitoring trademarks that are filed by third party worldwide. Uh, the service is not particularly expensive and you can know in advance um, if someone is registering a trademark identical to yours and you can act promptly, which is most of the time way cheaper and more effective than then having to start some invalidation action. Same of the internet. Internet, it's just, you can sit down, you can do it yourself for China. You can entrust uh, someone because of the language, but it could be also some of your business partner, for example. But is it used? Is someone copying it? Is it selling? Sometimes you will have wonderful surprises also to understand uh, the behaviors of your own business partner. So the activities of your own producers and distributors should be monitors as well, because sometimes the market can absorb much more than what it think it can, aside from a matter of IP 
protection. Um, physical market, trade fairs, and also some uh, domains name registry that can be monitored in the same way of the Trademark Gazette through uh, some services offered by um, law firms. Once you find an infringement of your brand, you have uh, three main routes uh, of action. The uh, administrative and customs, which is, let's say, customs is an administrative way, criminal or a lawsuit. So what you can do is that to um, you can <clears throat> allow a customs official to stop infringing goods to be imported and exported because China checks both import and export products. You can do raid action. You can seize infringing products if someone is producing copies you can seize them and a fine can be imposed on infringer for administrative uh, actions you will not recover you will not be able to recover damages but you can recover damages with a lawsuit of course it's more expensive it's also a little bit more lengthy but for complicated issues for patent infringement for design infringement it's most Time, mostly um, the best option, not just because the judges are more uh, knowledgeable of infringement compared with administrative um, authorities, which is better for straightforward cases, but because you can recover compensation for damages and for legal expenses. The criminal um, actions have got, of course, a highly deterrent effect. It's like a seizure, and then the person will be also be put to jail and imposed fine and destruction of the product. Uh, it's a little bit more complex to manage, um, but of course, and also it requires um, a threshold to start the action. So the value of the infringing products is higher than 50,000 RMB. In any case, there is, these are the instruments starting from administrative actions to civil lawsuit or criminal uh, action. And you can even decide to do like two or three. It's again an investment, but it's an investment they pay off because there is a lot of um, cluster of production in, in China. China as well, of counterfeit, unfortunately. So if you spread the voice that you're active in the market, it pays off in the long term. For a trade fair, you can remove the fake products from a stand in, in a trade fair in China if you have the right registered in China. It can be done through administrative authorities, so it's an administrative procedure. And um, it's it's pretty straightforward, but you have to prepare the documents, the certificate of registration, the evidence of ownership, the patent evaluation report if you want to enforce a design in advance, because the timing of the fair is, of course, very uh, limited. You can also uh, decide if instead of acting at the fair, you just want to collect information of infringement. For example, you have a hints, you suspect that your a specific products of yours is copied, you can go around the fair and check directly or through the help of an investigator and collect evidence of the companies that are um, copying your products, then check back uh, on the internet, do some further online investigation and start action in a second moment. The interesting thing is that the trade fair are one of the best moments to actually see the products, the fake products, because it's the time in which the products are shown, especially when it happens to have some, let's say, utility model for mechanism, you can actually see if it's the same. Sometimes for patents, you cannot, especially for utility models, you cannot see it from a screen online. Design and trademark infringement are easier to determine. And finally, the online world, you have the all market, huge market at your fingertip, you can check on the platform of uh, the sale platform or on uh, um, the search engine and uh, you can analyze the result and can remove the links. All major platforms in China have a very efficient system to remove links selling uh, counterfeit products. Counterfeit meaning using your, your right, uh, sorry, your trademark, your patent, your design, and your copyright as well. Um, it has also a return of, uh, of investment in, in terms of uh, um, building up a solid reputation 
in uh, in China also with your own possible business uh, partner. So let's close it with uh, some uh, ints. Uh, sorry, I swear I wouldn't say it anymore. I'll say it one last time. Register your IP right in China. Use attorney's expert in ju jurisdiction. The law and the procedure are different. Uh, monitor are they used in the market, uh, the activities of your business partner, and enforce your right against infringements. It can be uh, um, an effort, an economical effort, but it, it pays off in terms of uh, uh, reputation and also make solid use of contracts, NDA, non-disclosure agreements. When you start business relationship, um, try to um, also make some, if, if you have some production there, do not outsource all the production chain to, to one single partner. Try to divide it in modular sector in, so that nobody has the all know-how. Protect your trade secrets, um, train your employees, and all of this also enters into the, let's say, the contract law, which can also support a lot of the protection of uh, intellectual property rights. So feel free now to, to ask me any questions and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for the, for the presentation. It was extremely interesting. Uh, so it's time now to, to address the questions from our audience. So again, feel free to type your question in the in the interaction tool on the right hand of uh, of the screen uh, i have a question as well actually uh, coming from the your last part of um, of enforcement so what if a company for example uh, an european company that probably has not a extensive knowledge of china considering also that it's an sme so probably it's a family run company mm -hmm. uh, how should they monitor for example the search engine because from my experience as well google might not be uh, the best uh, source of information as opposed to baidu for example the baidu, Chinese. Yeah. Uh, um, and as well some website uh, alibaba or taobao this kind of information that it's known to people that work in china but maybe for uh, for European companies, it's still very uh, unfamiliar. Yeah, it's true. I mean, like like only um, of the Alibaba group, only Alibaba.com. It's it's in English. All the others are in uh, in Chinese. Uh, there are some uh, some um, companies, but again, also like the um, local firm, they they do offer this uh, service. It can be, let's say, uh, for small um, companies, it can be done like one off. So you ask for, let's say, a a, a picture overall of uh, your the user of the um, most of the time we start with the the trademark because it's a matter of typing in the uh, the trademark and seeing what are the search results it can also be done uh, let's say directly but i have to say it's not always very user friendly because sometimes this platform ask for registration and they don't ask you they don't show you the result unless you have an account so you can um, work with the with the with the with lawyers or trademark attorneys to ask for a one-off screen of uh, the situation on platform are their products branded with my trademark let's remember that we start with the trademark because doing a search on image for example for a design it's still um, very complicated like in terms of, of software, like image recognition software. So it's a search based on trademark uh, use. And it would be surprising, I mean, it cannot give uh, uh, 100% all the situation of infringements because sometimes it's just a picture used and, and the trademark it's not used, but it already gives some hints on how the market is moving and also if the brand it's it's known on the market. Thank you, yes, uh, it's very clear. Uh, also, we got a we got a question from, from one of the participants asking more information about the difference between the design patent and the protection that results from a design patent and a uh, 3D trademark. Um, the difference is 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 um it's it's very it's huge let's say okay but it's a lot of um, it's very academical let's say. 
the protection of the trademark it's um, it's broader okay a 3d trademarks will uh, will protect the um, I'll try to put it let's say in the academical way and then I'm gonna cut it short on what happens in reality the the trade the trademark will protect the impact uh, that that image has on a consumer if it can con confuse a consumer so it's let's say has a higher level of protection because the person that should be confused by that image for example a 3d trademark um the smart um the the car no the little car that one managed to get a 3d trademark recognition and also a design okay so if a consumer look at a, a car which is similar to uh, smart uh, they think oh it's similar to smart and that is a trademark infringement the design infringement require a higher level of the person that assess the infringement it's the expert in the field so even small uh, differences will will count and to exclude the um, the infringement. So to put it short, the thing is that to get a 3D trademark, so this higher level of protection, so that everything that resembles it, that a consumer can be confused with that shape, will be protected. It's very, very difficult. It's very difficult for many reasons that I'm not going to get into. Um, so it's very difficult to get the 3D trademark in the first place. This is why it's uh, it's much easier to get the um, design, a list until that specific shape gains so much recognition so has to be uh, co to be considered as a 3d trademark and have a higher level of protection because it's a consumer and not an expert that can be confused by the two products aside I don't know if I've been uh, clear but it, it's uh, it's a very no, it's, tricky it's a very yeah, tricky I, I guess it's very technical, <laughs> but uh, I think it, it was clear um well we're we almost ran out of time so uh let's go let's get to the end of the presentation just a minor reminder that uh, the slides of course and the video recording will be available from tomorrow on our website and also if you come up with other questions that you haven't seen addressed today feel free to send an email to me uh, you have the my email address on, on the first slide uh, and for future events, uh, upcoming activities, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, you can go on our website, uh, IPR Hub, and then select China or uh, follow our blog, Your IP Insider. Uh, well, then I take the opportunity to thank you again, Alessandra and Dana, for uh, your participation to the webinar. And uh, thank, a big thanks to, to all the participants for, for joining today's session. Uh, have a good rest of the day and I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you also. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye.